Hello, everyone. Um, we're going to get started right away. Um, welcome to today's exciting webinar around AI Simplified with Copilot Studio. It's brought to you, of course, by New Era Technology. And my name is Jackie Edwards. I'm the Global Marketing Director, and I'll be the host for today's session. Uh, we are thrilled to have you join us and really explore the future of AI and how Microsoft Copilot Studio is really taking complex AI issues and making them more accessible and practical for businesses. Uh, so we'll go ahead and get started with sharing a quick slide on who New Era is. Uh, New Era technology really empowers businesses to embrace the future workplace. And as employees and customers shift their perspectives on where and how work happens, New Era is here to meet you with flexible, resilient, and productive solutions. We have a global team of over 4,500 people throughout the world, and we're really focused on those purpose-built solutions such as collaboration and UC, data networking, security, cloud, managed services, and of course, digital transformation. So today we're going to have the opportunity to hear from Steve Daly as one of our guest speakers. Steve is a key figure in helping organizations integrate emerging technologies and his expertise in AI solutions, specifically Microsoft Copilot, is second to none. So really quickly, just wanted to kind of cover what we're going to talk about today, because Microsoft Copilot is really designed to alleviate several key challenges businesses are facing. So many companies are really having a difficulty integrating AI into their existing workflows, as well as they're finding it's very time consuming. And of course, we've got the other thing on the other side of the lack of AI expertise. And finally, it's all about security as well. So we'll be talking about today, um, Steve specifically, we'll be talking about today, how Copilot Studio can address some of those key issues. So as always, we encourage you to ask questions. There's Q&A, please um, go ahead. We'll try to address those questions right away or at the end during our Q&A session. The record, it is recorded, so don't worry, you'll get a copy so you can go back and revisit the information. And without further delay, please join me in welcoming Steve Daly. Steve, the stage is yours. Thanks, Jackie. Um, good morning, everybody. Good afternoon. Good evening, whatever part of the world that you're coming from. Um, Jackie did a great job setting the stage of what we're going to talk about this morning. Kind of, you know, what are the challenges that we've been seeing in the market and with our clients, as well as, you know, different solutions that that are out there. Um, one of those being Copilot Studio, which is a you know, a new name for an existing tool that's been around for quite some time and, and definitely been adapted for the what we're seeing in the market right now around generative AI solutions. So first, I wanted to pop up a quick set of poll questions just to kind of gauge everybody's experience right now. So, Jack, if you go and put that poll up, but it's really just kind of get some ideas of where we are with some of the people in the audience about what's your experience with, you know, AI tools um, in general with Copilot, you know, especially Copilot for Microsoft 365 as well as Copilot Studio. So the the we're not, it's an anonymous poll. We're not gonna, you know, we just wanna get some ideas of, of who we're dealing with. So how familiar are you with, you know, Copilot Studio? Good, oh, so we have people that are somewhat familiar to very familiar, that's good. Okay, and while we put up the next question, Jackie. So what's your primary interest? So a lot of different areas of capability with Copilot. We're going to talk about, you know, one or two kind of particular things. You know, we don't have a lot of time this morning uh, to show the full breadth of Copilot Studio, but this is really just to kind of give you a little bit of nugget information and, and get you some ideas of where to go next. So you can 
once you start looking at it, you know, what you can do with it. So this has got a good mix of different solutions that we're seeing, um, AI powered conversations, customer service, automating some sales processes. And then of course, the biggest bucket is always the, the epiminimus uh, other uh, category. So, and one more poll question I think we have. This is good feedback, just to get some ideas of what we're, who we have out there today. So have you used any AI powered tools in your business operation? So this is not really, you know, do you have kind of shadow AI going on in your organization, but do you really have AI tools um, in production uh, that you're using with your organization? Yeah, that's about what I figured, 50-50 mix. And so that's kind of leads in into the presentation. So let's, you know, let's go and get started. So a lot of what we've seen, you know, especially now in the market, you know, in, in 2024, you know, ChatGPT blew up in November of 2022. Um, everybody is is talking AI now, um, and it's it's the it's kind of become a fandom of of AI. These are slides, uh, you know, that kind of talk to that. This is uh, you know uh, you know for Microsoft's own deck of of you know customers need to find time to do things, and AI is that solution. You know, AI transformation is going to support your business growth. Um, you know, employees are using it and they're seeing value, but leadership is lagging. And then you know, obviously when with small, medium business and smaller companies, you know, using AI is going to allow you to really become more competitive in the in the space, and that's true to an extent. But what we're seeing a lot with some of the projects are, you know, there, there's there's uh, and this is you know a Gen AI you know project as a crate so to speak. But the challenges we've seen are you know high cost and limited functionality. You know, uh, there's uh, you know the user the per user cost can be fairly prohibitive, especially to smaller organizations. Um, it's difficult to justify the expense. There's, you know, limited use cases. I mean, there's a lot of kind of things that are out there about what you could use it for, but they really are either kind of uh, everyday AI ideas like, you know, crafting an email or setting up a PowerPoint presentation, uh, but it's really fairly limited. And so, you know, and that's extending out to um, bigger AI projects, you then run into inconsistency of quality. You know, you have um, issues with AI outputs, you know, hallucinations and things like that. We're seeing a lot of lack of customization. You know, there's tools out there that aren't allowed to be customized um, for your particular use case. They're kind of horizontal solutions that don't fit uh, your particular use case. It's a little bit of putting a square peg into a round hole. The biggest two that we see is is privacy and security concerns. Jackie mentioned it, um, you know, especially in the shadow AI realm, you know, people taking uh, company intellectual property documentation, posting it into chat GPT and 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 getting responses, you know, whether it's summary or, or questions asked or something like that. You know, that is, you know, data is getting leaked out of the organization. And, and while current, you know, terms and conditions might say that uh, OpenAI isn't going to be using that data to train, you know, there's there's no telling us whether that's going to change or when that's going to change. And the biggest one we've seen, especially this year, is is a, a very limited quantification of return on investment. You know, it's really been difficult really getting a hard dollar return on investment um, around AI usage, especially generative AI usage. Uh, because of the high cost, you know, we're seeing, you know, projects in Gen AI go from 100 times to even 5,000 times of anticipated cost when they go into out of proof of concept stage. So really getting that return on investment is very difficult because people are looking at big problems and they cost big money and take a lot of time. Um, and a lot of de lack of detail reporting. So I think, the, you know, as we've seen in a lot of technologies over the generations of technology you've seen in the past several decades, you know, the, the idea comes out, but then reporting on, you know, the, the usage of that technology is definitely kind of a lagging indicator. So what we've seen is really kind of this kind of trend, you know, tw late 2022 is when, you know, ChatGPT blew up the world. It's it's it was the fastest growing web application to uh, uh, for a period of time when it was released. Uh, it was interesting how OpenAI released it as more of a consumer product versus an enterprise product uh, to really kind of garner a lot of attention and and uh, and getting a lot of popular commentary on on the use of it. Um, and so 2023 became uh, a period of constant, you know, exploration. 
Um, there's a lot of rapid adoption and experimentation, <clears throat> excuse me, of generative AI. We saw it across different uh, industries and in our client portfolio, everybody was interested. We did see one particular interest in uh, industry above another. They were all very uh, uh, excited about the possibility of it. Uh, we saw some initial governance challenges, especially around security and data. You know, how do we get... Um, you know, governance around the, the data goes in as well as the data that comes out, and then some ethical concerns. You know, how ethical is it? And, and especially when you look at, um, you know, data that goes into generative AI and how certain data can, can taint the results of, of generative AI output and what does that exactly mean and how do we put some, you know, ethical um, constraints around, um, you know, models as they're being built. So this year, what we've seen, especially now that we're kind of in the back half of 2024, is, is kind of this cautious execution. Um, 2024 was supposed to be like the big, you know, adoption time. You know, we're, you know everybody's going to want to do something. And while we are seeing it in, in our in our poll kind of confirms it, it's about a 50-50 mix. You know, we're still seeing a lot of people very cautious. Um, there, there's a lot of regulatory scrutiny that's that's come out. Um, countries, uh, Europe has come out with some of the regulations. You know, President Biden put out an executive order earlier this year around some things, and even states are kind of taking some positions around uh, regulating around um, AI usage. And then again, continued discovery of fundamental problems, uh, data governance, like I mentioned, the provenance of the data, hallucinate, hallucination problems, and then cost and time overruns, just the concept of building um, something new or building a solution on something new like uh, generative AI has really become you know, a, an aha moment for a lot of organizations. And so looking into 2025, you know, I, I kind of see this as a as a conservative continuity. If you're familiar with um, you know, Gartner's hype cycle, they see generative AI kind of just in that tipping point of moving into the trough uh, of uh of lowered expectations and and trying to figure out what exactly Gen AI does. I do see it coming out, you know, probably in the next you know 18 to 24 months. We're gonna see a consolidation of best practices, you know, what we can do internally as far as and not only just best practices technically, but best practices as far as hiring and things like that. There was a paper that came out earlier this week or an article that came out that talked about, you know, companies looking at not necessarily Gen AI as a replacement for employees, but really, you know, employees having that skill set, understanding how to use a tool. Um, you know, I always use the analogy of, you know, if you walked into your accountant's office to do your to annual taxes and your accountant was still using a pad and a pencil, you probably turn around and leave. You want to see your accountant using, you know, the latest and greatest software as a tool to help them do their job. And I do see, you know, generative AI is becoming that tool. So you're going to see uh, strategic integration in, in, and jobs to be done within organizations, um, especially as you look at some of the newer technologies like um, AI agents and things like that. Um, you're going to see that as far as the continuity goes. So what we're seeing is, is interesting. And again, I think that the poll kind of confirms this is measuring and proving the business value remains the key barrier for adoption for a lot of organizations. And an interesting trend is it's actually gotten harder uh, in, in the past few years. So on average, we're seeing now only 48% of projects moving past the proof of concept stage and, and getting into production. Um, and just a few years ago, that was as high as 54%. Um, so, you know, it, you know the, the ex explosion of the tools is probably one reason. There's so many choices now that it's hard to decide. You know, I also think it's because of what I just mentioned earlier, you know, data issues, security, and, and regulatory issues that might happen, um, as well as just macroeconomic challenges here in the United States um, has caused a little bit of a slowdown. But then also the length of time. You know, now we're seeing the extent, the, the longer amount of time it takes to, uh, to implement uh, generative AI solutions has gone from 8.2 months, you know, from POC to production, when just a few years ago it was uh, 7.3 months. So it's, it's growing as far as the amount of time. So as an example, you know, like as Jackie mentioned, we do a lot in the in the co-pilot space. Um, we've done, you know, pilots implementations of co-pilot for Microsoft 365. And, you know, again, it's it's the same trends. And this graphic from, from Gartner shows that, you know, one of the biggest concerns around um, around adoption of, of Gen AI technologies like co-pilot is, um, is, 
you know, oversharing and exposing sensitive information? How do I make sure that, you know, the, the SharePoint site um, that Copilot for Microsoft 365 is going to index? How, do, how am I sure that that's not exposed something that's going to be a bigger problem? Um, how am I going to get um, clear use cases for certain personas in my organization to make sure I see return on investment that's, that's going to be achievable? And really what it comes down to a lot of people in, in our business is, you know, we get the question, when are we going to do generative AI? When are we going to roll out Copilot? When are we going to do this? And when are we going to go and do that? And really it kind of comes down to three major uh, discussion points. And I actually borrowed this from, from one of our analysts uh, who, who leads our AI workshops is, is you really need to answer the viability, the value, and the velocity is what it ultimately comes down to. What is the viability of putting together a generative AI solution uh, that can be focused um, and, and you know, not expose a data security problem or expose leakage? How can I keep the, the blast radius um, fairly small so that I don't open uh, you know, my company up to a bigger issue or, or employees into a bigger issue? How can I kind of keep make a solution viable? How can I provide the value? How can I do something that doesn't take, you know, eight months, eight and a half months to go to production? You know, how can I um, uh, make something happen faster? And this kind of ties value to velocity, but how can I, you know, have a, a lower capital expense and a lower operational expense and get a generative AI solution to help answer the when are we going to do this kind of question that we're hearing throughout the, our stakeholders. And again, velocity. How can I make something happen fast? How can I take something, uh, take an idea, um, whether it's, you know, like some of the questions we had, a sales um, option or a customer service option that I want to look at as far as a problem space goes. How do I make something happen fast? And, and more importantly, how do I adapt it fast? How do I take feedback? How do I look at analytics to determine how is it being used and how do I modify it and then redeploy the solution? And that kind of takes us to, you know, today's topic. Um, you know, Microsoft obviously has been a big proponent of generative AI across all their solutions. Um, it's almost gotten difficult to say the word copilot uh, because everything now has the copilot tagline. Um, Copilot Studio is a relatively new product. Like I mentioned earlier, it's actually a rebranding of a product um, that used to be known as Power Virtual Agents. Um, Power Virtual Agents is now known as Copilot Studio. It's the same kind of base kind of idea as far as what its functionality uh, it was. And now it's been adapted to be able to do generative AI solutions. So how can I take um, Copilot and, and Copilot Studio and build um, web-based chat solutions for my, for my customers and my stakeholders? So really the two biggest use cases for it are is, is with Copilot Studio, which is is a separate product from from Copilot for Microsoft 365. Um, it's a it's a, a tool that allows me to build uh, my own Copilots, so I can actually create uh, in the user interface that we'll show in a demonstration here in a few minutes a very simple way to uh, to build a Copilot uh, solution. So you can have a chatbot or a Teams channel or even a, a solution for your uh, contact center like Genesis or even Salesforce. Um, you can build your own call pilots. Secondary, you can actually customize Microsoft Copilot. So the Copilot for service, Copilot for sales, and even Copilot for Microsoft 365, you can you can use Copilot Studio to to um, to modify those solutions uh, to meet your own needs and, and requirements. So there's two flavors. Uh, today we're going to talk about Copilot Studio standalone. But for those of you that have Copilot for Microsoft 365, you do get Copilot Studio with that. It's a fairly limited um, product in that it is really just meant to um, uh, for modification of of existing Copilots. Um, and so the 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 term they use is channels, the deployment channels, and things like that are within that ecosystem. And and it's a great product, but it, it's tied closely together to Microsoft uh, Co excuse me Copilot for Microsoft 365, and is part of the license fees um, of that software SKU. What we're talking about today is is Copilot Studio standalone, and this is a key point. You can build Copilot solutions 
without having Copilot for Microsoft 365. This is a separate SKU um, and that you can that you can purchase, um, and it's and it's run as a software as a service solution. Um, and you can you can go there now. And I'll have the URL here in a few slides. You can go there now and actually start building your own Copilots, um, and then you actually have to get the license to to publish the Copilot. But you now you start playing with it, and you uh, so that's you know the, what we're going to talk about today is Copilot Studio. So what's in it? Um, I get the 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 building studio, which is what we'll see today. Um, and again, it's it's kind of the precursor. Was if you're familiar with Copilot Virtual A or excuse me, Power Virtual Agents is a very similar user interface. For those of you that might have looked at Copilot Studio earlier this year and in, in the first and second quarter of this year, what you're going to see today is is very different. And at Build in May um, of this year at Microsoft Build, they released a, a much, to be quite frank, a better version of Copilot Studio. Um, it, it they, you know it was a little rough earlier this year for sure. Uh, the product that you're going to see today and, and experience on your own after today is is a much stronger product, and I think you're going to see uh, see this kind of mature over time as people want to look at that, you know, um, value of uh, velocity and viability solutions that we talked about a few slides ago, it's really going to become the place that you're going to be able to build solutions uh, on a much easier um, uh, use case. So again, you can build your own co-pilot, co you know, using you know topic trees and intents. We're not going to get into that today because of time. Uh, you can uh, you know attach generative AI. You can publish to different channels. I mentioned a few: a, a chatbot for your website, a Teams a Teams agent inside of a team, uh, and there's several other channels that you can publish to, including you know voice channels and things like that. Um, and most importantly, built within Copilot Studio is is a very strong analytics and insights function. So you'll be able to see who's using it, how are they using it, you know, where are they having problems in the topic trees, and then how can you adjust that through publishing a, a newly revised um, Copilot chatbot. And then extending, you know, Microsoft Copilot I talked about earlier, you have conversational uh, plugins and, and AI plugins that you can use to be able to extend other Copilot solutions that are out there. <clears throat> so where this works in the ecosystem, like I mentioned earlier, Copilot Studio kind of fits into the Power Platform toolset. Um, and 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 this is done by by design because with Copilot Studio, um, and, and again, we're going to talk about some fairly simplistic use cases today in our demo. Um, in our training that we do, we actually look at you know integrating with Power Automate and, and Dataverse and other tools within Power Platform. But you can extend you know what you built in Power Automate and, and create a conversational UI in front of it. So, for example, you might have a a, uh, a paid time off solution inside of Power Automate, and now with Copilot, you can put a, a Teams interface on it, so somebody can say you know, what's my current balance of PTO, and then say, you know, can I ask off for, you know, October 1st to October 3rd, and then have Power Automate automate that existing process. Um, and then same thing with the rest of the Power Apps, you know, Power Pages, Power BI, and then of course, you know, Dataverse. So, you know, it, it's not, I say it's standalone in the fact that it's different than the Copilot Studio that comes with Copilot for Microsoft 365, but it's definitely not standalone when you look at how you can extend it. So you get a lot of out of the box connecting to the enterprise. You can you can still use, you know, the 1200 pre-built connectors that are part of the Power Platform. I've got a client who as a proof of concept stood up a, um, a very uh, simple Zendesk integration um, with a Teams chatbot where somebody could go to Teams and very quickly ask, you know, what's the status of my current ticket? It used the Zendesk integration that's already part of Power Platform and, and integrated with Zendesk and found that information. And the chatbot was built within a, within a couple hours at the most um, to be able to work out, you know, the authentication with the Zendesk connector and then, and then deploying it into production. It was a very quick process. And then I mentioned earlier about channels. So channels is where you can deploy these co-pilots. So again, you know, you can deploy them and the one we'll look at today is deployed as a chatbot on a website, uh, but it can be deployed in mobile. It can be deployed in Teams. It can be Facebook Messenger. It could be email. It could be Slack. It could be a direct line speech. And there's several other channels that are available to you that you see within the, the co-pilot studio um, interface. 
as well as you know uh, Azure. I mean, the thing is, is, is with Copilot Studio, and I failed to mention this on the previous slide, but with Copilot Studio, that you do have kind of an off ramp. So, if Copilot Studio solutions, you know, you become limited by what Copilot Studio provides, it's very simple to move Copilot Studio solutions into Azure AI solutions, uh, Azure AI Studio solutions specifically, so that you can move up, so to speak, and, and get the more, you know, if you have your own fine-tuned LLM or even your own custom LLM inside of Azure, you can actually have Copilot Studio front that as well. So what does it look like as far as building um, a co-pilot? So really, it's, it's, it's a very similar. You know, I'm, an, I'm a, a developer by trade, um, you know, and, I, and I like the agile process. It's a very simple process, similar process with Copilot Studio. It's you go into the studio product, you create, you manage, you publish, and you extend Copilot's you build, you know, um, solutions, and we're going to talk today about having a co-pilot look at a website for information and look at a specific file um, for source information, for grounding information. You can then extend it for, you know, specific topics. You know, if you have customers that ask specific um, topics about orders or product names, you can tailor that in the, in the topic UI. And then again, you can connect different actions that you want to have taken and then go through the process of publishing it, you know, monitor, improving it, and then integrating it with existing or extending it with other AI services. So let's, I'm going to flip over to a demo now. So I'm going to stop sharing my, my presentation and flip over to my web browser. But I do, you know, want to offer you to go to Copilot Studio to Microsoft.com. You can actually um, you know, kind of play with the product on your own, um, especially if you have a, a Microsoft tenant already, you log in with your credentials and, and you get access to their, uh, their demonstration license. You won't be able to publish um, into production, but you will be able to kind of get some ideas about what you can do with it. So um, let me go ahead and stop sharing my presentation and flip over to my browser window. Okay. So here is Copilot Studio. So this is the user interface for it. Again, if you're familiar with, you know, the Power Apps platform, it's a very kind of similar user interface. You have the idea of different environments you can run your applications in. Uh, but just kind of a quick look and feel. You know, here you have the, you know, some of the administration screens as far as, you know, going to create a copilot, you know, different copilots that have been built already, and then a library of different functionality that you want to extend your copilots with. What Microsoft has provided is a fairly significant set of templates you can start with. So they have some simple templates here. If I click on see more, um, it'll actually show me some templates that they're looking at um, deploying here soon. For example, you know, they're going to have an approval manager template, you know, that you'll be able to build a solution from scratch with, you know, a CV match or resume matching. So you can type in skills and it'll actually go out and find, you know, people that have that particular skill in the resume. Kudos, Jobscraft, you know, Wellness Check, these are others. There's also a whole ecosystem of, of Copilot Studio-based applications um, that you can find on, for example, GitHub. Microsoft has Copilot Samples uh, repository on GitHub where you can find other samples, and I'm sure there'll be other um, opportunities on, on GitHub as well to, to be able to do that. So right, what we're going to do right now is that we're going to build, a, a, again, a very rudimentary co-pilot just because of the time we have this morning. Um, but we do, in our in our solution around Copilot Studio, we do a, a full kind of lab-based training uh, where we'll build much more capable co-pilots. Um, what's interesting with co-pilot, just kind of out of the box, is you can actually use generative AI to build your first co-pilot. So what I'm going to do, I've got some copy here I'm going to paste and actually go through the process. You don't have to do it this way. I'm just doing it as, as a matter of a demonstration, but I'm just going to tell Copilot Studio, I want to build a Copilot for customer support. It will be an assistant for new era customers, answering some common questions and helping with common tasks. So I can start with any prompt. This works just like, you know, ChatGPT, Claude, or Perplexity. You know, I ask, and you can see there's actually some test prompts here above the text box here in the user interface. So I'm going to click a, a start. And it's going to walk me through a process, and I made the, the copy a little bit bigger. Hopefully, it uh, works out um, so everybody can view it okay. So it's it's taking me through, again, a typical chat interface. Um, you know, 
uh, your your co-pilot will assist new era customers. Do you have any instructions on how we should speak to customers that come to this particular chatbot? I'm going to tell um, uh, co-pilot that I want to use a professional customer focus uh, in responding to customers. You can have in one of the labs. It's actually funny. You can actually have it respond as a pirate. You know, you can, you know, it, it, so it's it's again, it's using uh, that interface, uh, that same chat interface and LLM capability that you're familiar with. So it it says, you know, understood. Your copilot will maintain a professional tone. Where can we find information? So this is like I talked about earlier. That, you know, one of the challenges with AI is 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 keeping focus on the data that you want your chatbot to be able to use. Chat, you know, Copilot for Microsoft 365. When you turn that product on, it uh, for for most cases, the nominal case, when you turn Copilot for Microsoft 365 on, as soon as you turn on your first user, it starts indexing all your tenant. Um, so you want to be careful to look at, as far as your technical readiness steps, you want to look at your data security before you turn it on because you want to make sure things in SharePoint, for example, are, are as secure as you want them to be. And you want to look at things like purview and labeling data and things like that. Um, it does, you know, Copilot for Microsoft 365 does take into account, you know, the user um, authentication and authorization to data, but it's still smart to look at, at the data footprint that you're having indexed. In, show, in SharePoint, excuse me, in Studio, it's actually asking me where, you know, what sources of information do you want to use for this? And we'll talk about all the different variety of, of information or knowledge sources here in a second. I'm going to tell it, use information from our website. And so it's going to go back and it says, we'll use this information. Um, are there any topics or tasks that we shouldn't talk about? And so I can limit Copilot Studio a little bit as far as what I don't want them to say, just for, for easy purposes. I'm just going to say no, just kind of finish this out. So it's going to go through the process and, and finish my base Copilot. So it's it's done and ready to go. Here on the right panel, you've seen it's kind of given me some ideas of, of what's going on as I've gone through this chat interface. And so I'm going to go in and click Create. <clears throat> so, of course, we wait and make sure the demo gremlins don't crush my demo here. It looks like I've, it's working OK. Um, it, and um, so what we're waiting for is the co-pilot to come back up in Studio so I can go in and modify things. So this is the developer interface um, for Copilot Studio. So again, here on the, the left side, I've got you know custom co-pilots. Again, I'm using the standalone version, so I can do custom co-pilots. I am provisioned myself for Copilot for Microsoft 365, so I have the option to be able to modify that co-pilot if I want. Um, and then across the top, we'll go over this in a little bit, but you know, I can extend the knowledge I want this co-pilot to use. I can define different topics, actions. This is where I can see analytics, and this is the channels that I want you know this particular co-pilot to use. Here in the center section again, more information about what the copilot. I can see the name, the description, and here's the knowledge that I wanted to have used. You can see now it's finished indexing uh, my website to be able to to be able to answer questions. Then within the interface here on the right side of the excuse, on my right side of the screen, I can test it. So it gives me an opportunity to actually test uh, the copilot. So I can you know do the basic you know hello just to get a response back from copilot. And then once it says, how can I help you today? I might want to ask a question like, you know, what services does New Era offer? And it's going to go through and use that website that it's been indexed and create an answer from that and actually give me a reference to the website page that has that information. And this is what's really cool. I haven't written any piece of code. It's literally that low code experience to be able to say, hey, you just use my website for information uh, to be able to solve problems. So here it comes back and says, here's our way, wide range of services, um, exactly what Jackie said in the opening um, slide of the presentation. And it gives me a reference. So I know uh, what that information has been grounded by, and I can go to that reference and that citation to see where the information came from. And just as another example, I can say, you know, where is our Cincinnati location? And again, it's going to use that same knowledge uh, capability to, you know, find information. So again, a very simple, you know, kind of, you know, way of showing uh, a co-pilot studio. So now I'm going to go through the process of actually publishing it. So this again is just in the development environment. I can do some quick unit tests. Now I'm going to publish it. Now I'm going to, since I'm going to publish it on a website, Copilot Studio by definition 
make sure that these co-pilots are secure, but, but since I'm going to put this on a website, I want to go through settings, change my security to allow no authentication because I'm going to use this on my website for customers that are going to visit my website. So I don't want to have to ask them to authenticate. And then I click save. It just says, are you sure? I say save. And then I say go to publishing. So as I mentioned earlier, there's several different challenges that we can publish. I'm actually going to go and click, excuse me, several different channels we can publish to. I'm going to go and click on publish because it does take a, a couple minutes um, to publish. So I'm going to click publish. And it's going through the process of publishing that as a, in, in this case, as a chat bot is how it, by default it, it publishes it. But it does offer several other um, uh, channels. So here you can see I can publish to Teams, I can publish to Slack or Skype, uh, even to Line, to GroupMe, to Telegram, even to email. So there's a lot of different options I have uh, to be able to publish uh, uh, Copilot Studio, Copilot Torts. So there, so now I've got the uh, uh, pilot, uh, excuse me, my, my studio uh, co-pilot has now been deployed. So I'm going to click on demo website. This is just a sample website, you know, that, that's part of Power Platform. Again, it's a similar experience with Power Virtual Agents. And now I've got a web chat that I can, you know, use the same kind of questions. What services does the error provide? And you can see now it's actually done a little bit more indexing and found some additional information um, and, and attached references to that. And then I can say, you know, again, where is your Indianapolis office? And it'll go out and find our Indianapolis office and provide a link to that as, a, as my new message here. And so it says where my Indianapolis office is and a link to our locations page um, within our website. So that's a very simple kind of chatbot solution that we built. Let's extend the knowledge a little bit. Um, let's, uh, you know, and again, we could do this a couple of different ways. Let's go to knowledge. I'm just going to add some knowledge to this chatbot. Again, I, I, I've only allowed it to look at, you know, um, the one URL. Uh, and then I can click public website. And let's say I want it to also include information about uh, from Microsoft. Now, obviously, um, you, know, you have to be careful with this because um, there's a lot of, of information in the news about you know scraping websites for for AI and things like this. This is a website that Microsoft allows us to use for this demonstration. You do want to make sure that you think about what you're doing when you're including different knowledge sources, um, and because you know basically what Copilot's going to do is, is is scrape the website. And additionally, that website might have tools to not allow me to, to scrape it for this purpose, but in this case, I'm certain it will. So uh, it's now going and, and getting that, you know, public website, putting it into the semantic index that Copilot Studio uses, um, and has now put that as part of the, the, um, the chatbot solution. So I'm going to refresh my test here, and then I can ask it, um, what is Copilot Studio? And it now is going to use the, that adoption website that I included as part of its knowledge base. And it's, it's still actually indexing, so it takes a few minutes. So there it comes back and says, Copilot Studio is a feature that helps streamline business processes. And it actually has done the same thing. It's created a reference link. So it's linking me out to, to Copilot, uh, excuse me, to the adoption website that Microsoft offers. And so that's that's an idea of what um, what can be done as far as extending knowledge. Again, it's only using um, this particular these two sites. It is using some other generative AI technology that's available within Copilot Studio. I could turn that off. Um, I'm leaving it on for the ca case of this particular uh, demonstration. But you can also add a file. So I'm going to add um, a file to the knowledge here. I'm going to click to browse. And I'm going to offer up, you know, Azure's, you know, the Azure compliance offerings as of this month. So I click add. And so now I'm increasing the knowledge base for this Copilot um, uh, application, and it's currently in process. You can see here it's indexing the information. So I'll give it a couple minutes for it to um, index that information. And again, I have to, you know, cross my fingers for the demo bots to, to allow me to do this right now. <clears throat> Still in progress. Oh, 
Well, it's still in progress. It's just in the matter of time because we have 20 minutes left in the webinar, and I do want to live leave some time for oh, there we go. Now we got it. So I'm going to refresh here. And then I'm going to say, you know, what are um, Microsoft's distinct Azure environments? And this is compliant, so I should be able to see that information in their compliance deck. And so again, I've increased the the, the copilot's scope of knowledge. And here it's, it's it comes back and says Azure Office offers four distinct cloud environments. And again, it created a reference link. So as, as a user, I then have a link to that data. And if I'm authenticated, you know, I, I can click that link and actually access the the content there. So again, this these are just two very 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 basic. Um, experiences that we've we've built inside of Copilot Studio. If I click on topics, this is where I can actually build um, topics and triggers. So if if customers ask certain things, I can you know route them certain ways so I can actually take them through a decision tree and take them to particular knowledge sources or even take them to a point where maybe they need to eject into a, a Genesis call center application or into a nuanced call center application. So I do have the capability of, of tailoring the experience and, and, and uh, designing that conversation and then providing a, a person the ability to, to eject into a real person if I wanted to. Actions, you know, we don't have time this morning to build actions, but this is really interesting. So as a, a reaction to a particular thing, and, and you're going to hear when we move into kind of the agent space in the next 12 or three months, you're going to hear the concept of a large action model, not just a large language model, but a large action model, uh, which allows, you know, AI-based solutions to actually take action from, a, from a, a model of actions that the particular tool has. And then lastly, analytics, it's, it's not going to really show much on analytics because I'm the only one using this particular demo, but you can see I've, I can look at the total sessions, the engagement rate, the resolution rate, escalation, abandon, customer satisfaction. You know, I see a lot of information. I could actually look at, you know, what topics are boosting conversations, you know, what are going to GPT, what's, you know, what's going wrong as far as, you know, what went through high, co high content moderation, what was filtered by OpenAI, et cetera. So that's, and again, we, we go into a lot more in our training class or training solution that we offer. And, and we, we go through a kind of a day of, you know, and, and go through a, a seven different labs, a very kind of deep dive lab environment with Copilot Studio. And then we move into looking at two proofs of concept. We then work with our clients around, you know, what are, what's some proof of concept that you actually want to do with Copilot Studio? What's the problem that you want to solve? So let me uh, close that and go back to my deck here. Let's see, go to you. Here, so again, with our demo, you know, take the time, you know, there's a lot of information that's always changing um, about Copilot Studio. You can go to Copilot Studio at Microsoft.com and actually play with the product in a, in a test environment, in a demo environment. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, you can, you know, schedule some time with us. This QR code will take you to a landing page that will allow you to go through the process of, of, of you know, going through our Copilot Studio, kind of a getting started uh, process where we, we do some training with you. We walk you through the process of creating Copilots that use example knowledge like I did this morning, but also how to extend it using Dataverse. How do I, you know, if I have customer information in Dataverse, how can I allow my salespeople to query, you know, what's the contact information or, or what's the status of the contract, et cetera. And then also we have, um, uh, you know, we've developed something we like to call the intelligent adoption framework, uh, and that goes across all our AI solutions, not just Copilot Studio solutions, not just Copilot for Microsoft 365 solutions, but other bespoke uh, discriminative and generative AI solutions. We actually have developed a, a really, really strong um, kind of framework to take customers through, you know, aligning on what you want your AI solution to do, how to execute it, build it, and then how to evolve it over time. So now what I'd like to do is open up for any questions that we might have out there. Um, uh, Jackie, so, you know, do we have any questions that have been queued up yet? Um, not at the moment, but I, I'll quick launch another poll because we did have one more question that I think would be really interesting to hear from the audience. So let me launch that quick. Okay, this is a great question. So how important is it 
for you to have AI powered conversational inter interfaces in your business. I know my answer is going to be extremely important. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it'll be interesting, and that's what Copilot allows you to do, honestly, is it allows you to answer this question by, again, when we talk about, you know, uh, viability, value, and velocity, it allows you, you know, for example, you know, it, it, you know when, if you have stakeholders that say, when are we going to get an AI-powered chatbot? With Copilot Studio, you can, you know, stand one up and see what the value is and look at the analytics and see, are we really seeing customers want something like this? Is this something that's really working? Are we seeing customers get really frustrated with it? Um, and are they ejecting to a call or are they dropping the chat altogether? So that's what's important with this particular question. And we're seeing, you know, it's extremely important all the way to extremely not important. But the second answer we have in the poll is somewhat important. So how do you answer that somewhat when you get the when are we going to do this kind of deal? So we didn't talk in the in the slides about you know what does it cost. So Copilot Studio to get the developer um, license, it's two hundred dollars per month um, per developer. Um, you know that's not cheap in any way, shape, or form. But as far as you know, for for a monthly subscription to again look at you know what do we need to do with with generative AI in in either an internal or external use case, it's a great method to be able to do that. And then with the two hundred dollars, and you also you get twenty five thousand messages per month. I've not seen a use case where users have consumed all 25,000 messages in a month. That's quite a bit of usage. And then you can purchase, you know, additional use case, you know, additional packages as far as uh, more messages if you see the need. Jackie, I think we have another poll that we want to throw up. Yes, we do. Um, in addition, we did get one more question and everybody can, you know, drop in Q&A here. Um, this is a great opportunity to ask those questions. Um, this one is about how does Copilot Studio ensure data security and privacy um, when using AI to process all this sensitive information? That's a great question. So what happens is, um, you know, A, you, you're controlling the knowledge that goes into Copilot Studio. That's one. Um, so instead of it going after and, and looking for things, it's the opposite. You're not, you're not kind of putting the indexer out to everything. You're telling the indexer what you want indexed. So in my case, you know, we we uh, we only set a particular file. We only set a particular website. Now, by default, and we didn't go into depth in today's webinar, but I did still have it open to using Gen AI. And I don't know if you saw it in the test chat. There was some uh, some subtitling that said it used you know Azure Open AI for some solutions that can be turned off very easily. So you can actually further tighten. Um, I like to call it the blast radius of your data. So you can there's further controls that we get into when you configure Copilot Studio to even limit it at that regard. And lastly, it does still take an account, you know, the the if you have purview or other things, especially if we indexed, you know, a copilot, excuse me, if we had copilot studio index SharePoint, which you can do, you can point it to an entire SharePoint library, it's going to look at what the that SharePoint library's authentication and authorization levels are. And it's going to take an account if you have SharePoint restricted search or purview. You know, so if I have an unauthenticated user like we did today, and it's pointing to a SharePoint library that doesn't allow everyone access, it's not going to allow that uh, result to show up in the index. So it does take into account um, the provenance of the security within that SharePoint library. So that's how it kind of does. So it's a variety of different methods. Again, there's, we didn't have a chance to go into it today uh, because of our time, but there's quite a bit that you could do with it. But most importantly, it allows you to start with a small blast radius because again, you can only have it look at one file. You know, you can have it only look at your, you know, uh, you know HR is a big one that we see in this in these use cases. HR doesn't want to necessarily point it to their entire HR SharePoint library because they're not quite sure that everything's as secure it should be, and they they worry about you know uh, employee salary or compensation data being uh, potentially exposed. Um, with with Copilot Studio, you can have it just look at the PDF of your employee handbook, for example, and answer questions just with that employee handbook. So that's how you know. So it's kind of you know, security by convention as far as how you actually, you know, provide information to Copilot Studios Index. Excellent. Great question. 
Yeah, that is definitely it's it's fun because obviously that's the biggest concern all of us have, right? We don't want to dump in the the wrong data. So putting those guardrails on it is just fantastic. Correct. Awesome. Uh, we get another question. What role or job function is this tool and other power platform tools best used for? And then there's a little sub question of is the goal for citizen developers to adopt this technology or should it be more technical roles? That's a fantastic question. Uh, we get this all the time because when you hear low code, no code, everybody's like, you know, democratization of technology and, and all the rest. Um, the intent of Copilot Studio, like really kind of the rest of, in my opinion, Power Platform is, it, it does allow kind of the citizen developer, the democratization of technology. Um, so it allows people there, I would consider more of a power user or something like that, that's, that understands the impact of what they're doing. So, you know, Copilot Studio is kind of marketed to be that low code, no code. In my opinion, it really is, it, it, it wavers more on the, row code kind of idea. I don't know if I would necessarily, especially in its current incarnation with Copilot Studio, I think, for example, it needs in its templates, it needs to be able to, um, you know, tailor only certain templates to particular users. So maybe tighten down the authorization that you give users within Copilot Studio. So for example, they can't create a Copilot that can index a competitor's website, for example. Um, so I think you're going to see in the in the maturity of the product over time. Uh, I know in my conversations with with Microsoft and with with Gartner, uh, th this tool is going to be marketed more towards a low code, no code solution. But I think it right now, in my opinion, in its current state, it really you need to think more about the pro code kind of idea. And also when you want to move into from Copilot Studios feature set into Azure AI Studio, that's when you definitely are gonna move into more of the pro code kind of interface where you want uh, more people involved. But in a way it does kind of answer that, you know, when do we question, you can say, here's, here's Copilot Studio, you know, build something and give it a whirl, especially with the demo license you can get when you go to copilotstudio.microsoft.com. You, you can let people you know build things um, that they want, but again, make sure they're educated. It does, you know, a lot of the rules still apply, right? It's still generative AI. Um, you still have to worry about data that you're putting out there and what you're exposing to people. Um, so there is some, you know, you do have to be cognizant of what you're putting in to Copilot Studio for sure. Great question. Excellent. I think we have a couple more, I think at least one more poll question we want to ask, I think. Yep, yep. I will launch. We have, we have two. So the next one is around challenges. So this kind of is a good question to go right with the question we were asked in the Q&A. You know, what are the challenges you foresee? Uh, mine is training staff. That's what I would say. Um, again, it's a tool that, um, you know, it it. Again, to use my synonym of a blast radius, there's a potential where the blast radius could be big. Um, if you let somebody, you know, create a chat bot and, and they put some internal intellectual property of, you know, PDF of something that shouldn't be out there, um, that still is possible. And that's, that's training and, and, and some governance. Um, so I, and, and that's also lays into the data security piece. That's, you know, making sure people understand they, they know what they know. And, and that's, that's obviously the a problem that everybody is dealing with now because people need to understand what it means when you take a document, you know, I had a customer a few weeks ago who, who is getting ready to turn off access to chat GPT and all the other tools like it, because they have, you know, shadow AI people taking internal, um, intellectual property documentation or creative documentation and putting it out to chat GPT. And again, right now, you know, open AI is saying that they won't index it, but you know, there, you, you just don't know what you don't know. And there's a lot of other tools other than chat GPT, chat GPT and especially nefarious tools out there that might not have the same kind of guardrails as, as open AI is put out for chat GPT. So yeah, data security is, 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 is something that everybody should be educated about. Um, you know, even now with the, the current situation with tools. Outstanding. Well, um, we haven't had any other questions. Um, could Steve, could you hop back one slide for me? Sure. Just wanted to point out um, just really quickly, 
we obviously have a, a huge portfolio of opportunities to help customers, but you know, today specifically, we wanted to just double uh, address that we have this lab-driven workshop that is available. Um, this little QR code will take you right to a form, and then we can get started. These labs are customized, so it's really important to think about what your needs are going to be, and we spend a little time talking about that with some of those key um, influencers and stakeholders, and then ultimately help you build out some Copilot Studio um, conversational chatbots if that ends up being your need. So uh, just wanted to point that out as one of the ways that we can definitely help right away. And then Steve, if you don't mind, we'll go back one more. Oh, oh sorry. Yeah, it's okay. Yep. Um, and then I just wanted to point out again that we do have a full series of workshops as well. I think that's uh, very important because a lot of companies, as Steve said, are wanting to put in AI, but the adoption on getting the projects actually to the finish line, the numbers have changed greatly. Steve, what did you say? Most of them are was it almost 50% are not yeah. making it? Yeah, almost 50%. Yep. And and th this is just Gartner saying, and I think you're seeing a variety of different, you know, we're seeing from, from Copilot for Microsoft 365 implementations um, being slowed down because they're trying to find the return on investment to display bespoke solutions, um, there you're seeing a slowdown because again, you know, it's a data security issue that they might find. So there's a lot of different variety of reasons for this number, um, but it, it is a big challenge. I mean, it's a lot of people, uh, it, it's just interesting, you know, we get, I have another diagram that I show where, you know, us as technology subject matter experts are getting pressure from, you know, uh, executives and sales and marketing and others to use these tools and they really need to understand it. And I think, again, as we're as we're going through this process, these these discovery of situations or issues are, are coming to light. And, and that's what's causing these numbers, you know, the, the adoption number to go down and the, the length of time to go up is because there's some consideration that needs to be had uh, before you start on this. Because, and, you know, you see on the other side in the news, there's there's big issues when something goes wrong. It goes wrong in a big way. And so you need to think about those things. And I think that that level of, of like I mentioned, earlier, you know, cautious and conservative uh, moving, you know, the, the idea of 2024 moving into much more of a cautious execution and next year being more conservative continuity is, is that, you know, kind of moving into that trough of disillusionment kind of idea, again, using Hart Gardner's hype cycle, is, is let's think about this a little bit more. There's definitely some value here. I think there's still a lot of, of good uh, research out there that shows that generative AI will be a tool that uh, eventually everybody's going to use in their business. And, you know, our development, our development teams love, you know, uh, GitHub Copilot, for example, because, you know, no developer, very few developers love writing unit tests. And, and GitHub uh, Copilot helps do that. Um, uh, that's actually going to be our next, you know, webinar that we're talking about is, is talking about GitHub Copilot and what that can provide development teams. But it, it's a little bit, you know, the, the ROI in, in GitHub Copilot is a little more solid because if I can have a tool help write better unit tests and better unit tests mean that I'm going to have better software. And I know I'm making some broad generalizations in that comment. I don't want to get flamed, but, you know, if, if, if it's done right and with proper development, you know, DevOps and DevSecOps tools, you really can, you know, see a better ROI in tools like that um, as opposed to, you know, other Copilot tools. So, yeah, we, we definitely see those numbers, you know, hopefully ticking up, but I still think they're going to kind of keep the same velocity uh, until you see more adoption of tools like Copilot Studio. Excellent. Yeah, and that's why those workshops are just so helpful to be able to make your plan and then pilot and ultimately um, get to the adoption phase a lot faster. So excellent. All right. Well, um, we have one more poll really quick. Um, so I just wanted to get that back up here. There we go. Um, we just really wanted to just quickly know um, how likely it would be to recommend our Copilot Studio to others. And um, 
looking forward to having people give some feedback on that. I wanted to thank Steve again for presenting. He His time is very valuable and I just greatly appreciate him sharing all this info. I really personally enjoy the demo and seeing how quickly and easily it can be implemented is very exciting. So with that, we please be watching. We will make sure, of course, you have the recording and as well, we'll be sending out invitations to our upcoming co-pilot um, next in the series around GitHub. So that'll be happening shortly. And with that, thank you so much. Everyone have a wonderful day and we'll look forward to seeing you in the upcoming GitHub webinar. Thank you. Thanks everybody.